Just beyond the city walls, in a garden tomb, lay the body of Jesus, wrapped in linen. And the hopes and dreams of his followers are entombed there with him. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, hearts heavy with grief, make their way to the tomb. As they approach, they discuss the heavy stone sealing its entrance. They wonder how they might enter the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with spices. But when they arrive, they discover that the unimaginable has happened. They find the stone rolled away. Fear grips their hearts as they step inside, only to find that the tomb is empty and that the body of Jesus isn't there. Suddenly, two angels of the Lord appear before them, each wearing white. And with the roar of lightning and thunder, they declare, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Those words echo deeply into their souls, dispelling the darkness of grief and despair. For Jesus, the one they've given their hearts and lives to, is indeed alive. Today you're invited to discover the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and to experience the overwhelming gift of grace and salvation that's being offered through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Good morning. Welcome, guys. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. How are you doing? Today, we got to proclaim it, right? We're, we're blessed beyond being blessed. Amen? Can we stand, guys, and start with a word of prayer? Welcome to everybody. If it's your first time here, definitely, definitely make yourself at home because the Lord's home is your home. Amen? The Lord is good. And remember, remember, guys, that, that his pain healed our scars. His death opened a way, and his resurrection gives us what? Eternal life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, guys. Uh, dear Father, we come before you, Father, so thankful. Above all things, Father, thankful this morning, Father, for your, for your life, for your resurrection, Father. We just uh, want to praise you, give you the honor and the glory, Father, for your son who did the work, who did the job, who offered us grace and saw it fit to die for us, even though we weren't worthy, Father. I just proclaim your victory. We could proclaim your victory, Father. And I ask that you would touch hearts this morning, Father. Work in those, Father, who are hurt physically, who are hurt emotionally, and who might be hurt mentally, Father. Be with them. Strengthen them. Give them hope, Father. As we come before you, Father, we just uh, want to praise you, give you the glory. May this worship be for your honor, Father. I pray that you... Just uh, anoint Pastor Manny tremendously, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, and we all said, Amen. Amen. My God still rolls 
souls away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. the house of the Lord sing praise. Let's sing that out one more time. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it out, there's joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise.
Shaking in the dark, all creation felt the Father's broken heart. Tears were filling heaven's eyes. The day that true love died, the day that true love died, when blood and water hit the ground. Walls we couldn't move came crashing down. The day that true love died, the day that true love died. Search your heart, you know you can't deny it. Lose your life just so you can find it. The Father gave. His only Son, just to save us. The earth was shaking in the dark. And all creation felt the Father's broken heart. Tears were filling heaven's eyes. The day that true love died, the day that true love died. Blood and water hit the ground. Walls we couldn't move came crashing down. We were free and made alive. The day that true love died, the day that true love died. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, Jesus is alive, oh he is alive, he rose again, the earth was shaking in the dark, and all creation felt the Father's broken heart, tears were filling heaven's eyes. The day that true love died, the day that true love died, when blood and water hit the ground. Walls we couldn't move came crashing down. We were free and made alive. The day that true love died, the day that true love died. Come close. Listen to the story You may all be seated I saw Jesus crucified I spoke to him as he died I saw him in his struggle I watched as he breathed his last breath, and when he stopped breathing, I lost my breath too. The one who walked on water is no more. The one who fed 5,000 is now food for the worms, and if he has been defeated, what does that mean for me? I thought that he would be the king who would rise up and rule our nation. I thought that we were the ones to bring truth and revelation, but it turns out we were wrong. I mean, maybe we imagined this all along. As I watched his body taken down from the cross, I saw my friend was gone. And he was the one who found me. How could this be? He must have gone before his time. It must have been too soon. It must have been an illusion or a dream. He can't be in a tomb. I can't come to grips with the thought that the man who claimed to be I am was slain by the hands of men. And then, she burst through the door. Our friend Mary, she said, someone had taken the body of the Lord. 
So we ran to the tomb, only to find an empty room. And the stone was rolled away. I looked on the floor, and I saw his clothes. And that's when I knew he rose. Jesus is alive. He did walk on water. He did feed the 5,000. He did raise Lazarus from the dead and heal thousands. He did make the wine. He did talk to God. He did pray for those who put him on the cross and he raised back to life. Just like Lazarus, except for he would never die again. Jesus took death. Nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head for you. He laid his life down and he took it back again. Jesus is alive. Good morning, everyone. Do you guys get that that um, that video? I was thinking about like on Good Friday, after Good Friday, when when Jesus uh, was nailed to the cross, when he said it is finished, when he gave his spirit unto his Father. I would imagine people were bummed. You know, uh, we we read in Scripture that the disciples kind of met, you know, in in the upper room. Uh, we read of uh, disciples walking on a road. I would just picture with their head down. Um, and so it is a it's, a, it's a time of doubt, it's a time of grieving, right after Good Friday, right? But, but today is a day of power, it's a day of hope. It's a, it's a day that we could be sure that because he rose that we will one day rise as well. Uh, because there's power in the resurrection, it's called dunamis power, where we get the word dynamite from, that we can live in power as well. And so I love that video, because Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, I believe, said that if... There was no resurrection, then our faith, faith would be futile. And so our faith is not futile. I want you to know that. The devil will try to tell you that every day, but it's not. There's power in the resurrection. Amen? Amen. And so happy resurrection, happy Easter. Happy Easter to you, Mr. Randy. Happy Easter. I get to be up here with the young guys so that I can feel young. Um, we're so proud of you guys for coming out in the rain. You know, we, we, we were praying. We usually meet at the community center on Easter, but they're doing construction there. We like to meet there because... There's something about having the whole church together, going to the park, things like that. But the Lord knew what he was doing, huh? If, if, uh, if we would have went there, we wouldn't have been able to go to the park. We would have got all wet. The roof would have probably been leaking more than in here. You know what I'm saying? So God is good. God is good. And so there's a tradition, Randy, that, that we've been sharing for a long time uh, during Easter that Christians have been doing for hundreds of years. Um, and it's based on the fact that that the disciples found out that he had risen. The, 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 the downcast face, the, the, the bum heart rejoiced because he had risen. And so I like the fact that it says he is risen, not he has risen, because he still sits at the, at, at, right next to the Father, right? Advocating for us, praying for us, being there for us. And so we're going to do this thing where I'm going to say he is risen, and you as Christians... I'm going to say he has risen indeed. He Amen. risen indeed. And so we're, let's, let's, let's lift up the tiles a little bit in this place. We have a, a, a sound meter. You guys don't know, but it's, just, it's back there. And, and after tomorrow, we're going to just detect who's louder, first or second service. And they say that second service is rowdy, right? A little more, the, more rowdy, rambunctious you know, crowd. You guys are like, you know. But let's, let's, let's prove them wrong. Amen? So he is risen. He is risen indeed. He has risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. So we want to encourage you. Randy or I are here to encourage you, welcome you to Calvary Chapel Amani, and, and just kind of spotlight a couple of announcements. If you guys walk through that door, there's a, a poster there that has a, a QR code. If you, if, you, if you take a picture of that, you will be able to download our app both on the Apple phones and Android phones, and that'll tell you just the different things that are going on here at Calvary Chapel Almani. This is where Randy and I are going to just highlight a few of the announcements that we want to share with you because God is so gracious in doing a lot of different things. The church, for the most part, is open every single day 
of the week, not just on Wednesdays at our midweek, but, but every single day of the week, and we thank God for that. And so the first thing that we want to remind the ladies that the ladies have been get, getting together for a study in 1 John, uh, a woman's study called True Fellowship. And so it's for ladies 16 and up uh, through the, the, uh, the letter of 1 John on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. They, I think they're only two weeks in, so there's plenty of time for you to, to come um, and join the ladies and get to know other ladies and fellowship with them and then grow in your faith in 1 John. The other thing that we wanted to tell you is that we have something special uh, this year for, uh, for fathers and daughters. We're having a father-daughter dance that's going to take place on Saturday, April uh, 13th from 5 to 8.30 p.m. And so it's gonna, we're going to clear all this. Uh, there's going to be a dance floor. There's going to be a waltz. Don't be scared, dads, okay? Uh, there's going to be a lesson before so that you have the steps down. Um, but it's just going to be a beautiful day to be able to spend with your daughter or daughters. It's $40 for you and your daughter, and if you have additional daughters after that, it's just $10 more. I, I have, there's a rumor that it's like a prime rib dinner. And so, man, you know what I mean? It's, it's pretty good. And so we just want to encourage you with that. You sign up for everything that we talk about um, pretty much on the uh, app, so that's why it's worth downloading the app so that you can get plugged in with the different things that are going on. Uh, Randy, you're, you're married. How long have you been married now? Almost, Almost two brother. years now. Two Almost years. Two. Amen. <laughs> and so you, right? tell us a little bit about the marriage fellowship yeah, that's coming Yeah, so we're up. excited. There's going to be a marriage fellowship. Let me see a show of hands really quick if you're married. If you're married, right? There's no way it's that little of you. Let's go. Let me see. Let me see your hands. Um, if you're married, we just want to encourage you to come out. Um, what I always see it as, as it's an investment to invest in your marriage, right? What you reap uh, or what you sow is what you're going to be reaping in your marriage. And so we want to encourage you. We're going to have a marriage 101 fellowship. It's going to be on April 19th, which is a Friday at 7 p.m. Refreshments will be served. Um, and this is for married couples and engaged couples as well, whether you're newlyweds or you've been married for 50 plus years. Um, it's always so important to make sure that we're investing in our marriage and even just getting back to the basics, uh, God's design for marriage and the roles in marriage and how we can truly edify one another as we draw closer to the Lord. So we want to invite you out to that. Um, and just want to mention as well that right now, um, Pastor Henry and I are both going through the app right now. The, the Calvary Chapel Almani app is where the bulletins are, uh, but it's not only the bulletins. You can watch our live stream studies on there. You can read the Bible on there. Uh, there are daily devotionals that are sent out. So many resources for you. And so we'll give you just like a minute if you want to right now. You have our permission to take out your phone and download it. And even if you want to follow along, we know it's up here on the screen as well, um, but there's more detail here in the app as well. I also want to mention that uh, the church is going to Mexico. Woo! right? But not on vacation, um, on a missionary trip. But what's cool about missionary trips is you enjoy them so much, I would say that the Lord blesses you even more than just the vacation. And so we would encourage you, if you're at all interested, it's going to be April 26th through 28th. The cost is only $100 for the entire weekend. That includes your lodging and I'm sure some of the food as well. And so you really can't beat that price. And the idea is you're going so that you can serve the one true and living God and he is going to bless your socks off. So we encourage you uh, to check out the missions table if you have a chance or speak to Art Frias as well as he oversees the Mexico mission trip. So we're really excited for that. Um, and then the last event that we have going on that we want to mention as well is our Women's Spring Luncheon. Uh, we're excited for that. This is for ladies 16 and up. It's going to be on Saturday, May 4th at 11 a.m. here at the church. Um, pastor's wife, Clarissa Hussein from Calvary Chapel Sweet Hills is going to be giving a guest message that day uh, from John 14, 27 on the peace of God, which we're really excited about who here needs peace in their lives, right? And so ladies, we encourage you that you come to the Prince of Peace that day and that you would come and enjoy that message, enjoy the fellowship. The cost is $28. Uh, that's because there's going to be a, a catering service by Corner Bakery that day. And so you can sign up there uh, just on the graphic. So everything that there's a sign up for here, as Pastor Henry will always tell you, you can just click on the graphic there in the bulletin as well, and that's how you get involved. Um, and then last but not least, we want to mention as well that if you felt le feel led to give here at Calvary Chapel Almani, it's a labor of love. We don't pass around the collection plate. We simply let you know of the opportunities that you have and the ways that you have to give to the Lord. Um, and as the Lord leads, we're praying and hoping that he, that he would lead you to give uh, to him. 
And so you can give online on our website at CalvaryChapelAlmani.com. You can give on our app as well. It's safe and secure through there. Or you can text the word GIVE to 626-727-8808. Um, or last but not least, you can do it the old-fashioned way and drop your envelope in the agape box in the back, which is simply just a wooden pulpit that looks like this uh, by the front door over there as well. And so we're really excited that you guys are here, right? We want you guys to get plugged in. For sure. It, there's something special about Resurrection Sunday. It's so cool because a lot of times you see faces that you haven't seen in a while. And I do pray that this would be kind of like a trampoline for you, to, just to remind you who you are, what Jesus has done. It's not a religious thing. It, 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 we, do, we come to church. We get involved. We open up our word. We pray because it's a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Because of what he's done for us. So we want to encourage you. Keep coming to church. Keep coming. Invite people. Uh, we don't know how much time we have. We look at the world and we just see it, right? It's just going down. And so we want to let people know the hope that they find in Jesus. You want to lift this up in prayer? Yeah, yeah. And I would encourage you guys, seize the opportunity you have today because God wants to speak to you today. There's going to be a lot going on today. Uh, maybe the Easter egg hunts are canceled because of the rain or whatever it might be, right? Maybe you're thinking about what you're going to eat after um, or whatever it may be. But we just invite you that as you're here sitting in this seat, that you would be still and be ready for the message that God has for you today because he, wa he wants to change your life. He wants to speak to you today. I guarantee it, but it's on us to just listen. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, just thanking you for this morning, God, thanking you for every individual soul that is here today, God, and knowing, Lord, that you see everything that's going on in their hearts, knowing, Lord, that you know the exact solutions to our problems, Lord, knowing, Father, that the greatest need that we have, Lord, is the, the need for forgiveness. And Lord, by your death and by your crucifixion and by your resurrection, Lord, we can be forgiven and we're grateful for that, Lord. It's a, it's a debt that we could never pay, Lord. But we thank you, Lord, that you gave your son so that one day we can go to heaven, Father. And we pray, Lord, that we would all come to that realization and that revelation of truth today, Lord. That lives would be saved, Lord. That souls would be secured in eternity, Father. And so, Lord, we pray that you just be with us today, Lord. Bless Pastor Manny as he comes up here to share the word as well, Lord. Anoint him, Father. Anoint our ears as we listen. We love you so much, Lord, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before, if, before I get in trouble with the ushers, the ushers ask me if you guys can kind of do the, the little kind of squeeze in. If you guys are saving seats, they're going to be looking at you side-eyed, okay? So it's just, just if you guys could scoot in. That way, if there's people coming in because of the rain, they're a little bit late. I see people walking in. There's places for them to sit. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Let's all stand and worship together.
before you this morning, Lord. I pray that you would just bless this uh, morning, Lord, that you would just open our hearts up, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would just, um, just uh, minister uh, to us, Lord, this morning um, as it is uh, Resurrection Sunday, Lord. And we just remember uh, what you've done on that cross, Lord, for, our, for us, Lord, and for our sins, Lord. And uh, you are risen, Lord, and you are alive, Lord. And uh, we just pray that you would just uh, bless the congregation who are here, Lord, and those who are on live stream as well that you would bless Pastor Manny as well, and uh, just use him mildly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You can go ahead and greet one another. Good morning. Are you guys awake? Man, you came even though it was raining like crazy, huh? I am so proud of you. I, was, uh, I woke up this morning, I said, Lord, you're testing them, huh? <laughs> and you came. I'm so proud of you. Um, obviously, today's a special day. Uh, today is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Basically, what we're celebrating is the fact that Jesus Christ conquered the coffin and there is power in the resurrection and did you guys know that we can live in that power and so maybe you're here today you've been struggling um, I, I pray that you would embrace what god wants to do but real quick it's a special day for a lot of things one of the things did you guys see the balloons out there so i pray that you would take a picture you and your loved ones maybe even you by yourself i'm not sure how you work it out couples you know 
and then post it on Instagram and then tag the church, if you would. Uh, I'm not an expert on social media, but you guys, how many of you have Instagram? I'm just curious. So some of you do, right? So yeah, that would be really cool. And then if you tag the church, if it's okay with you, we'll put it on our story and uh, we'll just uh, make you famous. That's what we're going to try to do, okay? So we love you guys and we're just super, super excited that you're here. Again, like I said, it's a special day. So I asked Naomi, I just uh, sprung this on her real quick. If she could pick um, some numbers out of this uh, things, these we have three bags. This is what we used to use when we would uh, pass around for the offering. And so we have some gifts that we want to give away. We're just going to give away one now and then one later. And one of the, uh, the way that we're going to do it, just to let you know, uh, what we have to give away to begin with is... Um, this amazing Bible from our amazing bookstore back there, it's uh, the Ryrie Study Bible. And basically, if uh, you guys, we kind of come from a Calvary Chapel background. If you're a Calvary Chapel pastor, you have to have one of these Bibles, these Ryrie Study Bibles. The, the notes are amazing, especially when it comes to prophecy and the, our, our perspective on theology. So we're going to give this away along with this DVD right here. It's uh, on the resurrection. And so maybe you have kids that might want to see that. It's told by Pastor Chuck Smith. And so the way that we're going to do it is we're going to, the first bag is going to tell us whether uh, the winner is from the north or the south. And so go ahead, Naomi. What does it say? Oh, no, that's the wrong bag. Put it back. <laughs> okay, this is the one right here. I am so sorry. We've never done this before, as you can tell. Okay, so this is the south side, so it's going to come from this side. Okay, you can put that bag in for a second service. Okay, now you can pick one from there. Now, we're going to pick the row, the row it's in. This is going to be the, the, the closest person to the seat on the inside. Number one? Row number one? Wow. Okay, so it's one of you guys. <laughs> all right, and again, the closest person to the seat. Two. Two, all right, so that would be you. Larry, you won. <laughs> all right, you guys, isn't that cool? Well, we're going to give away one more afterwards. Naomi, thank you so much for doing that. I know I put you on the spot like that. It's just, uh, I was telling my wife, it's Easter Sunday, it's a special day, we normally don't do that, but um, you know, today is, uh, it's an exciting thing to think about, and so um, real quick, I wanted to, just in case, um, you know, I, I don't know what you got planned today, most of us are probably going to get together with our family, we're going to grub, uh, we're going to have a good time, but um, let's not forget really what the main purpose is, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so if you have maybe, I would say, probably about a half an hour today, you can sanctify, set aside to read your Bible. Uh, we have some uh, uh, scriptures that we kind of want to show you. These are the core scriptures on the resurrection. And so obviously it would be the last chapter of Matthew, the last chapter of Mark, the last chapter of Luke, and the last two chapters of John. And like I said, it'll probably take you about a half an hour to read through. And there's something about reading the Bible that gives uh, power. It's, uh, it's a living word. It's a working word. And when you read your Bible, it's like a seed that goes into your heart. And so these are the core scriptures. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, believe it or not, some say this is the most important chapter in the entire Bible, 1 Corinthians 15. The first four verses tell us exactly what the gospel is, that Jesus died for our sins, that they put him in a grave, then he rose again. And you believe in him and what he's done for you, then you're saved. So that's why that chapter is an amazing chapter. The whole chapter is about the resurrection. And then Psalm 16, verse uh, 9 through 11, especially verse 10, a beautiful three verses on the resurrection. It was actually a prophecy regarding the fact that David would rise because the Holy One, that would be Jesus, his body would not see corruption. And so that basically says, David said, I will rise because Jesus rose. And so I just want to encourage you to, to do that. A lot going on. 
Um, again, you're going to hang out with your family. It's a beautiful thing, but maybe you can set aside about a half an hour to read your Bible. And then there are some of you here. The next uh, chart we have right here are some recommended books on the resurrection. And so uh, I know, I think we're living in a generation in the United States of America. Most of us are going to the movies. Most of us are watching TV. Most of us are scrolling on our phones. And so again, it's fine. You guys want to do that. We do that. We all do, right? But I think that we need to kind of go back to reading. Uh, reading is huge. Reading is good for you for so many reasons. And so maybe, you know, you get a good book and you learn about the resurrection these ones right here, a testimony evangelist by Simon Greenleaf. Uh, he was actually the dean of law at Harvard University. Um, the Case for Christ by Lee Strobel um, is actually a book we have in our bookstore. If you guys buy it today, it's on sale for $9.99. No, I'm just joking. I don't know how much it is, <laughs> but it's a great book. Um, Simon Greenleaf was an atheist examining the evidence for the resurrection. So he did, he was challenged by his students to examine the evidence. And in the process, he became a Christian, an advocate for the gospel. Lee Strobel was an investigative reporter for Chicago Tribune. And this guy right here, Frank Morrison, he also was an investigative reporter. He was an atheist as well. And uh, when he looked at the empirical evidence for the resurrection, he became a Christian. It happens every single time anyone is truly open on whether or not he really rose from the dead. If you're open, you'll discover that he did, and that's why we follow him. And then this other book right here by Josh McDowell, he was an agnostic. Uh, this book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict is also in our bookstore right there. And Josh McDowell was an agnostic. An agnostic is an individual, and maybe, you know, there's someone here who's an agnostic who says, well, you know what, you can't really know whether there's a God. You know, it's beyond our knowledge, and that's where he came from. And again, just looking at the evidence, he in the process became a Christian. And so, um, yeah, let me pray with you. Lord, I thank you for everyone here. I thank you, Father, that uh, you, they had it in their heart, Lord, to come to church service. And I, and I know it's not because of the church. It's not because of uh, the pastor or any of the leaders. I know that. It's not because of them. It's because of you, Lord, because of Jesus Christ the one that was nailed to a cross and rose again because of you. You drew them here, Lord. I know that's why. And so I thank you for that. I pray that you bless this time as we study your word. Some of the people here, you know, we're, we're kind of been walking with you. None of us perfect, but in that good place. And then there are many maybe who are here struggling. I pray that they would take advantage of the opportunity that this day represents in which we can commit our lives to Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, do that work, we pray, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wanted to begin something I read today about um, passwords. So you guys have passwords for your social media, right? You got passwords for your email, um, passwords for different websites that you go on to, things that are happening there. I was reading an article about how everybody has passwords. They said that the average person has a hundred passwords. Did you guys know that? That's a lot of passwords, right? They say recently uh, the number of passwords have increased by 25 percent. And so how many of you guys struggle with passwords? I'm just curious. Don't you hate it? You're like, man, thank God for that, like, face recognition, you know, or whatever, touch ID, things like that. But, you, you know, we still have passwords and all those things. And so they say uh, the most common password, does anyone know what the most common password is? One, two, three, four. Oh, that's probably it. Password. Whoa, okay, never thought of that. But one, two, three, four, five, six is number one. ABC, one, two, three is number two. I love you is number three. And football is number four. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> they say that you're supposed to have a different password for every account. Do you guys know that? For every account. Because you know, a lot of times we use the same password because, you know, remember, he said, no. If you want to be secure, you want to have a different password for every account. You want to lose long uh, pass phrases. You want to avoid sensitive and guessable information. 
You want to regularly update your password? How many of you here have had the same password on that one place for five years, six years? You know? <laughs> and then, uh, I hate this, the two-step authentication, but you guys, this, this makes it secure, right? And so anyways, I was just thinking about this. Lord, one of these days, I'm going to take a vacation, and I'm going to update all my passwords, man, because <laughs> it's so hard to do. But the only reason I brought that up is because I was thinking about it. Imagine one day you die and, and, and God says, what's the password? <laughs> You'd be like, oh man, I don't even know my email. <laughs> and for us, I just want to encourage you to know the password is Jesus. J-E-S-U-S. Simple. You know, I used to tell my kids when they would go to sleep, I, I would say, hey, how's someone saved? And they would tell me, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And it's true. You got to look into that. But then I would tell them, well, give me the easy answer. And they would say, Jesus. And I need to tell you that right from the get-go. Because in all reality, this is why he died and rose again, so that you could be with him forever in heaven and not just have life when you die, but life while you live. And the way that we receive that life, the password, is Jesus. It's not a religion. It's a relationship where you give your heart to him. And I want you guys, I pray that we would know this and that we would experience him. And so today, the study is the proof of life after death. And I kind of have an acronym that I want to give for you uh, to kind of remember these things and I was telling my wife, if any of the people here remember the acronym and they can come up to you and tell you what they are, you can give them a free book. And so let me show you the acronym right here. Uh, it's P-R-O-O-F, and we're going to look at it. Well, I'll try to do it real quick. Uh, number one, a premonition within. Number two, the resurrection of Christ. This is how we know there's life after death. Number three, the occupation of the apostles. And in one sense, that's like the New Testament. And then number four is the observation in the scriptures, and we'll say that's the Old Testament. And then the F is the, the faction of the Christians. And I'll explain each as I go uh, through. But I want to begin, if you would, open your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And if you don't have a Bible, go, you can raise your hand, and one of the uh, ushers will bring you a Bible if you would like. I know some of you guys might open it on your phone. But um, if you don't have one, it's kind of cool to look at it on paper. Ecclesiastes is after the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs. It was written by Solomon. And this is the first point. Like, how do you know there's life after death, Manny? And there's probably a lot of other uh, things that we can talk about, whether or not be someone's, you know, who actually died and came back or just different aspects like that. But the P stands for the premonition within. And the premonition is basically an inner sense that something's going to happen, that something's going to happen in the future. That's the premonition that we are all born with. And so if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, look what it says here in, in verse 11, the beginning of the passage. It says, He, that's speaking of God, has made everything beautiful in its time, also, he has put eternity in their hearts. Other translation says he has set eternity in the human heart, or he's planted eternity in the human heart. You know, the, the thought of life after death, uh, it, us living forever, actually begins with a premonition, an inner sense, an innate uh, ability that we have that something is going to happen in the future that that we will go on to live forever as a matter of fact one man his name is adam clark he said that the proper translation of this passage right here is that god has placed eternity in our hearts without which man could not find out the work which god hath made from the commencement to the end See, he put that inside of us, you guys. And in other words, what, what that means is that we're wired that way with the concept of eternity in our hearts. And therefore, we're going to search for that. How can I live forever? Where will I live after I die? Otherwise, we would really have no hope of finding that path to paradise. 
You know, life after death, I tell you, it's innate. It's a premonition. It's an inner sense that we were born with. It's kind of like this. Let me ask you a question. Do you guys ever look for your keys? I'm just curious. Do you ever? Okay, you wouldn't look for your keys if you didn't have any keys. You remember the days before you had a car? I mean, you didn't look for your keys then, right? But in, in one sense, this search for life and meaning and, and heaven is there because we have that hope set before us because God put it inside of us. And that's why we search for that. In David Guzik, uh, he said, the preacher understood that man has an awareness and a longing for the eternal and that God has put it in their hearts we can say that eternity is in our hearts because we are made in the image of an eternal God. I think we know, unless we believe the lie that's fed to us, that's foolishness. Isn't it crazy? These guys with this uh, PhD and, you know, all these universities, you know, nowadays, the Bible says professing to be wise they became fools. And they'll tell you that when you die, you stay dead six foot under. You turn into dirt and that's it. That there's no soul, that there's no spirit that lives on. They're fools. They're suppressing something that is within us. We know there's life after death. As a matter of fact, if you look here at Ecclesiastes 3, look what it says in verse 14, same chapter. He says, I know that whatever God does It shall be forever. You will live forever. You are part of what God does. We will live forever. And there's something inside of us that just, it's it's there. It's a premonition. We know it. You know, and and one of the, the ways I think that we can probably get in tune with that inner Uh, understanding is when a loved one passes on you know it was in 2020 may 14th when my dad passed away it was december 16th last year when my mom passed away many of you here have experienced the passing of a loved one and you know what i'm talking about and there's something inside of us that just knows there is no way that this is over that one day we will see them again. Why? Why do we know this? I know I'll see my dad. I know I'll see my mom. I know I'll see, and I have you know, beautiful in-laws and friends and so many over the years that you know, heaven has become such a desirable place for me now because so many that I love are there and, and there's just something inside of us that says, I know that I have the hope of seeing them again. Why, why is that? It's because of this premonition within. It's, it's an inner sense that something will happen in the future, and that is life after death. And so that's the P in the word proof. And, and then for the word R, I was wondering if you could turn to Matthew 16. For the letter R, we have, how do we know there's life after death? Number one, the premonition within. Number two, and this is the obvious one for today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is why we celebrate today, and it's just a wonderful celebration. You know, Friday, can you imagine what Friday was like for the the apostles, the disciples? Friday was the die day. Friday was the why day. All their dreams, dead, buried, gone. That was Friday. And I'm sure Saturday wasn't any better for them. It was like, you know, I say it this way, Saturday was the sadder day. I mean, it must have been horrible for them because they thought that he was the one that was going to set up the kingdom right there and then. And so it was, it's a sadness beyond measure. All hope was lost. Their deliverer had died But then Friday, the die day, the why day, went to Saturday, the Saturday, and then Sunday, man, imagine the ladies we're going to see. They went to the tomb to finish anointing his body. The angel had come, rolled away the throne, and announced to them that Jesus Christ was not there, that he had risen from the dead. 
And Sunday, uh, just like the rising of the sun, was the Son of God alive who had gutted the grave, defeated death. And not just for him, for us as well. And this is why, I mean, to me, this day is such a beautiful, beautiful day. The resurrection of Christ is one of the most documented events in the history of the world. How do you know there's life after death? How do you know that a person doesn't just die and stay dead? Well, the premonition within and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is one of the most documented events in the history of the world. As a matter of fact, he predicted that he would rise from the dead. If you look here at Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 21. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised from the third day. He, he told them, he showed them. If you look at Matthew chapter 17, look at verse 9. It says, now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. You see, he predicted this. If you go over to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 17, it says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road, said to them, Behold, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and they'll deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. You see, I just picked a few out of Matthew because I don't want you guys all over the place. But man, it's just everywhere. Through the ministry of Christ, he told them that I'm going to die, I'm going to suffer, but I will rise from the dead. Houdini predicted he would rise from the dead but he stayed dead. <laughs> Jesus Christ predicted it, and then notice if you, if you go to Matthew 28. I love to hear those Bible pages turning. Matthew 28, look what it says in verse 1. This is now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance, check this out, was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. They passed out. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and indeed he has gone before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you, the angel said. And so they went to the tomb. They were going to anoint the body. Uh, they were even wondering, man, how are we going to move this uh, stone? You know, for those of you who have gone to Israel with us, you've seen this tomb. It's a beautiful tomb. It's empty. It doesn't have any any sort of uh, decomposition. There's never been a person buried in this tomb and you wonder why. It's because Jesus was there. His body saw no decay. There's an empty tomb, but an empty tomb is not enough. You have to see the risen Lord, which is exactly what happened when you read here in verse 8, Matthew 28. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. How do you know there's life after death? Well, the premonition within and the resurrection of Christ. And it's not just Matthew. We have Mark. We have Luke. We have John. The four Gospels tell Jesus' story, and they all have the same ending. He rose from the dead. You know, the news of Jesus rising from the dead immediately spread 
in unparalleled fashion. Now, when you look at, at history, you have close to 6,000 Greek manuscripts. You have 10,000 Latin manuscripts. You have over 9,000 manuscripts in different languages because what we find is the evidence is overwhelming. Let me ask you a question today. Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Because that's going to be the, the, the question of your life. You know, I, I was interested in, to find out that, um, I don't know why I thought of this, because I think in one sense, you guys are a jury. You know, you have to look at the evidence, and you have to make a decision. Did he rise or did he not rise? Now, what I've discovered is that a lot of people, they don't like jury duty. A lot of people, did you know that they ignore those jury duty summons when they come to them? How many of you guys here ignore them? I'm just curious. Some of you guys do. They say that 45% of people in California ignore their jury duty summons. I was really surprised to see that. Only 27% of people, adults, have actually served in jury duty. And so, you know, I, I, most of the time they don't prosecute. So I'm not trying to tell you to ignore it, you know, because there's just so many that go out. You know, it's hard for our police to enforce such things. But I will say this, that they, they do. Uh, if you ignore them over and over again, eventually they might come and get you. I just want you guys to know that, all right? Uh, as a matter of fact, I was reading one article about a 21-year-old man in Florida who was sentenced to 10 days in jail uh, because he didn't respond to the jury duty. And so anyways, I just want to give you a quick warning on that. Um, and for two reasons, okay, here, here's the thing. I think there's two reasons that we should do, do jury duty. Number one, because you might get busted if you don't. <laughs> but number two, because it's the right thing to do. Don't you think? As a citizen of the United States of America, I know we're busy, even me, I don't like to do it in one sense, but then in another sense, I do because it's part of our just society. And when it comes to the resurrection, you know, you, I, I know a lot of people out there, they're, they're skipping jury duty, they're not making a decision, and on one day they might get sentenced to jail time or, you know, things like that might happen that are bad, but it's the right thing to do. The one who changed the world through love, you and I, we got to come to a decision. We can't just st straddle the fence and, yeah, 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 I think so, but, you know, it's not that really. But it's an either he did or he didn't. And we have to make that decision. You know, I mentioned Simon Greenleaf earlier. He's one of the guys that checked out all the evidence. And I, I, I think I mention him every Easter service, so forgive me. Uh, for just being repetitive, but he was the dean of law at Harvard University. He wrote the book on evidence admissible in the court of law. His students challenged him to examine the empirical evidence on the resurrection of Christ. As an atheist, he thought he would write a book to show the world how foolish it was, and in the process, he became a Christian. I encourage you to check out that book, The Testimony of the Evangelist, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, by Simon Greenleaf. You know, one of the things he mentions in the book is that, you know, the body of Christ was never found. You know, how do you know Jesus rose from the dead? Well, one of the things that's interesting is the, is the body was never found. And that's a huge thing, right? I, I don't know if you guys ever watched 2020 or like those, you know, murder mystery shows, but, you know, they go to great extent to find the missing bodies, right? You guys have seen that. I remember reading one a murder investigation where in order to make a pivotal point in their testimony, the district attorney had to dig up a body that had already been buried. They needed to determine if the victim's contact lenses will, were still in her eyes when she died because for some reason that would prove that her husband had killed her. And so they dug up that body and sure enough, when they looked in her eyes, they were able to see that the contact lenses were there and the evidence proved that he did it. And so the primary point I'm saying is that just bottom line, if necessary, even if you have to go down to the grave to get a buried body, you will do so. You will find the body to prove your point. And so why didn't the Jewish religious leaders ever produce a body? 
Even though they hated Christians and everything they lived and died for, they never produced the body of Christ when that simple, tangible evidence would have been all that would have been necessary to debunk and defeat the disciples, to kill Christianity. So, you know, when you're looking at the evidence, you're, you're, you're looking at things like this, especially when you consider the fact that, you know, everything hinges on the resurrection. You know, it, it, what if the, you know, unbelievers uh, fabricated a story what we find is that this is impossible for two reasons. Number one, you know, because they said, well, the Christians came and they stole the body. Well, this is impossible because, number one, there were Roman soldiers there who were guarding the body. And believe you me, when you're talking about Roman soldiers, there's only one way in, one way out. Their life being on the line, they would not allow that to happen. Number two, the, the disciples wouldn't have stolen the body and then claimed that he rose from the dead because no, the disciples were actually at the time when this was all happening, they were afraid for their life. They thought their Lord was lost, that he died. And so who would believe in a dead Messiah? You know, why would these fearful men, what explains the fact that these fearful men who at one time were trembling in their boots what changed them from these fearful men to the courageous uh, proclaimers of the gospel that they became? The only explanation is that they really did see Jesus Christ rise from the dead. And so, again, the, the first piece of evidence is the absence of the body. The second piece of evidence is the testimony of the witnesses and so I think it would be good if you would to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. When you're doing jury duty, which I know you guys are going to do from now on, <laughs> you know, you listen to the evidence, right? You listen to the witnesses, and up comes one witness, and then another, and then another, and then another, and then Imagine you're during jury duty and 500 witnesses come up and tell you the same story. What, what are you going to believe? This is exactly what happened. Look here at 1 Corinthians 15, uh, in verse 3, Paul says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to Scriptures, that he was buried, rose again the third day, according to Scriptures, and that he was seen. He was seen, first of all, by Peter uh, or Cephas, then by the other apostles, the 12. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. That, in other words, they saw him all at one time, of whom Paul says, as he's writing 1 Corinthians, which is only about 20 years after this event, that most of them were still alive. Some of the greater part remain in prison, but some have fallen asleep or died. After that, he was seen by James, who was a doubter. That was Jesus' brother. Then by all the apostles. And then last of all, he was seen, Paul said, by me also as one born out of due time. When you look at the list of witnesses here, they weren't just the followers and the friends of Christ. These were unbelieving family members. These were even hostile enemies. What changed them? They saw him. They saw him. Listen, you can't be part of the jury that just ignores it. No, we have to make a decision. And when you look at it, you find that they never produced a body and there were over 500 witnesses, including people who at one time were skeptics and, and enemies of Christ. You see, when you see this, it's an amazing thing. I, I don't know how many are here today, but there are many here today. And we're going to see this kind of the way it all works together. Who have seen Christ. You have seen Christ. He's appeared to you. He, he lives in you. You have. There are witnesses here today who say he's alive. And that's why for the rest of, of us, Man, I pray that we would take heed to the witnesses. I mean, and they come in all different shapes and sizes and backgrounds and ethnicities and even ages. I was reading a story about a fifth grader who was given an assignment by her teacher to write a one-page paper on her greatest living hero. And she chose to write her paper on Jesus. 
And so the teacher, Mr. Thomas, he returned the paper to the little girl and he told her, I'm sorry, Miha, the, the person you wrote on must be alive. And the little girl said, don't be sorry, Mr. Thomas, be happy. Now you know Jesus is alive. <laughs> and it's like, man, now Saul knew. You know, again, there's ample proof of his resurrection. Number one, his dead body was never found. Number two, there were over 500 witnesses. And number three, the dying death and breath of the disciples. Now, this is a real big thing. If you think about it, a lot of it hinges on whether or not the apostles of Jesus really saw the risen Lord. You know, after Judas betrayed Christ, there were 11 apostles left. And I, I don't know if you knew this or not, but out of the 11 apostles, uh, 10 of them were slaughtered on this issue. They were put to death in, in, in crazy ways. James, the son of Zebedee, was killed by the sword. Peter died close to 30 years later. He was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified in Greece. Philip was crucified in Turkey. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, was flayed. And in other words, they tore his skin off of him while he was alive, and then he was crucified. Matthew was beheaded in Ethiopia. Thomas was killed in India when he was thrust through with spears and tormented with red-hot plates and then burned to death. James Alpheus, he was thrown down from the temple by the scribes and Pharisees. He was then stoned and clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot, he proclaimed the good news of Christ's resurrection in Egypt, Cyrene, Africa, Libya, Persia, but eventually was crucified. And, and Judas Thaddeus, preaching the risen Christ to those in Mesopotamia, in the midst of pagan priests, was beaten to death with clubs. You can also include Paul the Apostle who was beheaded. And so, you know, the martyr's death of all these men is a powerful proof for the validity and reality of the resurrection. Listen, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, why would they die for something they knew wasn't true? He is alive. We know it. We know there's life after death. Adrian Rogers, he said, hypocrites and, and martyrs are not made of the same stuff. People tell lies to get out of trouble, not into trouble. A man may live for a lie, but none would ever die for a lie. If they knew it was a lie, the, the apostles died terrible deaths because of the fact that they were witnesses of the resurrection that they knew to be true. And this is why, when you look at Christianity, some people say, well, Christians, you know, they check out their brain at the door. Absolutely not. Geniuses are Christianity because all it takes is someone willing to reason with an open heart. And once they have that heart, they follow Christ. You see, we know the premonition within. We know the resurrection of Christ Thirdly, and now we'll move quickly, we know basically the occupation of the apostles. And you can turn there if you want um, in the book of Acts chapter 1. And I really do encourage you to read your word, to read your Bible. And if you're here today and you don't have a Bible, let us know. We would love to give you a Bible. One of the things about God that's just so amazing to me is just like us, whenever there's something important, you have to put it in writing. This is what God has done in the Bible. And as you read the book of Acts, it's an amazing book. Basically, you have the four Gospels of uh, Jesus uh, manifested, and then the book of Acts, you have Jesus preached. And this is how the church was built. And just real basically, what I, what I want to say is that they just preached the resurrection. This is really just what they preached. Acts chapter 1 Notice what it says in verse 1, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Basically, um, Luke says, I wrote the gospel of Luke. That's like part one. That's just the beginning of the work. And now this is part two. 
right? Verse 3, he says, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so we don't have time to get into it. I have a whole bunch of verses here. I'll read a few of them to you. But I would encourage you, go read through the book of Acts, and you're going to see how everywhere they went, the occupation of the apostles was not necessarily to go, because nowadays you see preachers, and they're talking about a whole bunch of stuff. And they're talking about, you know, how you can live a good life, and how whatever, you can get in, in shape physically, and how whatever, you can make more money, and how you can have a happy life. And there's so many topics that, unfortunately, many churches have been distracted with when the apostles went. What they preached was Jesus died for you, and he rose again. And they just kept preaching that because there was power in the gospel and they just kept preaching that acts 2 23 him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of god you have taken by lawless hands the crucified put to death whom god raised up whom god raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it acts 2 27 for you will not leave my soul in hades nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Acts 2.32, then Jesus, Jesus, God raised up, of which we are witnesses. Acts 3.15, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead. Acts 4.33, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They just kept telling people about the fact that Jesus died and rose again. This was their occupation because there's power in the gospel. You know, I alluded to 1 Corinthians 15 earlier, and it's such a powerful chapter because, unfortunately, there are some people that had crept into the church and said, there's no resurrection. There's no resurrection. And so Paul has to write the chapter and tell them, man, how, how wrong it is that someone could presume or presuppose there's no resurrection from the dead. And so he goes on and he deals with that because it's impossible to prove a universal negative. And he tells them there in 1 Corinthians 15, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. You start hanging out with the wrong people and they tell you, I know there's no, no life after death. It's going to take a toll. You got to live and hang and fellowship with people who believe these things that we're talking about. And when you read 1 Corinthians 15, it's a really cool chapter because, um, you know, they start talking about, well, what kind of body? What kind of body are, are, are we going to have in heaven? You know, and he talks about the terrestrial body, which is an earthly body. He talks about the celestial body. And he talks about the glory of the different stars. And I just want to, real quick, when we're talking about the resurrection, I just want to encourage you to know that we will have a body that can travel through the universe, that we will have a body that can live in the presence of God, that I will be taller. I'm telling you guys that right now. <laughs> because my body's starting to break down i'm like man what's up with my knee and my shoulder and my wrist and my tooth and i gotta go in and they're gonna take it out and my brain i mean you name it man. but this is you know but i will say this though that your body is like a seed it says there in first corinthians 15 is going to be planted in the ground so you look at a seed and it's not all that great right it's like a little seed but you put it in there and then next thing that that that, that, that grows up is this beautiful flower beautiful you it's still going to be you in heaven. Your DNA will be preserved, but you will be glorified. This is the power. This is the hope. This is the truth of the resurrection. There might be some of you here that won't be here next year. We don't know what will happen. I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow. But I do know this, that even though I, I die, I, I won't die. I will live. This is the transition into my heavenly home. You know, there's so much that the apostle said, and I'll read to you 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so when you read the New Testament, 27 books, it's all apostolic, that was the occupation of the apostles. And then the observation, this Second O is that in the Old Testament, 
And, you know, you read uh, the scriptures, and like, for example, Job 19, 25 to 27, for I know, he said, and when Job was there and he was sick and he was suffering and he was probably thinking that he was probably going to die, he, he had no doubt. He struggled with why he had to suffer the way he did, but he knew, it says in Job 19, 25, that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh, and there's that resurrected body in my flesh, I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Did you know that the book of Job is the first book of, of, written in the Bible? In the very first book, Homeboy knew that when I die, I'll see God. See, it's there. It's, it's just the observation of the Old Testament. Psalm 17, 15, As for me, I shall see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. We're made in the image of God. We're going to be there uh, to be able to see him. Psalm 49, 15, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave for he shall receive me. And you read through the Old Testament. I mean, even for example, something like Genesis 25, 8, that says, then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. And that's what I'm talking about. You see the same thing in Genesis 35, 29 and Genesis 49, 33, where they were gathered to their people. How many of you here, you have a loved one uh, they've died. And, and maybe, I, I don't know if they were religious or not, but, but all it takes is faith in Jesus. And you know they had it. And they're there in heaven waiting for you. But the big question is, do you have that faith? Have you given your heart to Christ? Not head, not the brain, the heart. What we find is that there is a place called heaven, but there's also a place called hell. And you can read about it, for example, in Luke chapter 16 or Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing, you who dwell in dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. There is life after death. But it's not that everyone goes to heaven. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, narrow is the road that leads to life and there are few who find it. So what we find is that, man, we got to make sure, you got to make sure that you have received the gift of salvation. Uh, I've shared this with you before, but there was a guy at a cemetery and he was there at the cemetery, and he read a tombstone, which, believe it or not, sometimes I go and visit my, the, the tombstone of my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. And uh, I know you read them, and it's interesting. This one said, pause, stranger, when you pass me by, for as you are, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. So one man read the words and he pondered them deeply and then he bent down and he etched further on the tombstone to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> it's crazy. Some people believe, have you ever heard in reincarnation? Oh yeah, there's life after death. Uh, I'm just going to be reincarnated into a butterfly or something, you know, or... Whatever, and, and that's how foolish that is. You want to know the foolishness of reincarnation? Um, what that means is that you don't believe in a personal God. Because what reincarnation is, you keep being you know, born again into different forms and, you know, until eventually they want you to reach a point where, you know, you like Buddhism, Hinduism, where basically you deny yourself to such a point that you lose your very existence so that when you reach uh, that, that state of nirvana, they say that you become like a drop in the pond and you completely lose your identity. That's the foolishness of reincarnation because, again, we know the premonition is not, no, I don't live with a God who is an impersonal God. 
we have relationships with people. We have a relationship with God. I won't lose my identity. I'll find my identity, and I'll be there in heaven forever. It'll be you with your DNA, you glorified forever in heaven. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, and just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes the judgment. And so, are you guys getting the acronym? The P is for the premonition within, the R, the resurrection of Christ. O, occupation of the apostles. The other O is the observation in the scriptures. And the F, the last one, is the faction of the Christians. And when I say faction, I don't say it in a negative sense. It simply speaks of a smaller organization within a larger entity. And that's who we are. We Christians are the minority. That's who we are. We're a smaller organization within a larger entity. You know, we, we, we Christians, what happens is like, well, what do you mean? How's that proof for the resurrection? Because when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. When you give your life to Christ, and I'm not talking about a superficial commitment. I'm talking about when you love him, when you follow him, when you make that decision to live your life unashamedly as a follower of Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. And then, like we read in the book of Acts, chapter 9, 17 and 18, the scales fall from your eyes, and then you can see. Like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, 9 and 10, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. If you're here today and you drifted away from God, you need to come back. You need to run back to God. Because we're talking about a life forever in heaven and we're talking about a life with whatever time you have left on planet earth to live it for him. It's important that we understand that if you're here and you, you're, you don't know whether, whether or not you're a Christian, my Today is the opportunity to, you got to make sure you have to know this because God wants to give you the power of the resurrection. You know, when I was thinking about this, and we'll close with one last thing. So maybe there's someone here today and you're like, well, I'll, I'll be a Christian. I'll, I'll, I'll do it full bore if you show me a sign. Okay, Ready? Here's a sign. <laughs> Who wants it? All right, Richard, come on up. Hey, Richard. You can't give it away. I'm just joking. I wanted to say it's all yours, it's a gift. You received it. And that's how we're saved. It's a gift. If you want that gift today, rededicate your life, first time commitment. We want to give you an opportunity. God loves you. God died for you. He rose again. But you got to have that faith. And once you take that step of faith, there's something about coming forward. There's something about Easter Sunday. There's something about making that type of public confession that brings in the power of God. So if you're here and you've never done that, or you're not sure where you stand, you need that recommitment, you need first time. Man, we're going to sing a song, and as we're singing the song, I'm going to ask you guys to come forward, and I think we have some new believer counselors. Maybe we can have some pastors come up here as well. And, uh, and that way you know you're not alone. And so as we sing this song, if you want that gift, it's a free gift. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You just come forward. Don't be afraid. Just come on up 
And you watch what God will do because I'll never forget the day that Jesus Christ came into my life. He came in to my life and he wants to come into your life. He wants to, but he won't force himself. You got to make that choice. So don't let the enemy keep you in your seat. Whoever you are, you need that commitment. You just come forward and we're going to pray for you today. God's going to meet you here. God will work. Lord, I thank you for your love and your grace. I thank you for your mercy and compassion and love. And I pray, Lord, for those that need to come forward today, that they would not be afraid and that they would not even hesitate, Lord. I believe that you're here with your power to save and to bless and to do a new work. And so I pray, Lord, you just draw us together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So come on up. Those of you guys that need that prayer, you come on up and we're going to pray for you. Come to the altar, the 
Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So real quick before we leave, I know you guys have a, an exciting day ahead of you, and I, and I pray it would be awesome as you spend time with your family. But I remember when I got saved, when Christ came into my life, the, uh, the pastor gave the altar call, and, you know, um, he just kept saying, I, I sense there's more of you. I sense there's more of you. And after he said that, I think about 35 times, <laughs> eventually I, I went forward. You know, I had the, the grace and the courage to be able to go forward. And like I said, on August 20th, 1989, that day, Jesus Christ came into my life. And there's a power that I can never, ever explain. And he's never left me. And so I, I know there's more of you. I know it can be a little hard to get up in front of everybody. But, but Jesus died on a cross for us in front of everybody so don't be ashamed you know if you need prayer we'll see we're seeing that chorus one last time if that's you come forward we just want to give you that opportunity and for all of you guys who came forward um, after the service is over we would like you to come to this back room right here we want a, a, a counselor to follow up on you uh, get your name and information uh, social security card no, I'm sorry. Um, so that we can just encourage you in that new relationship okay so we'll sing that chorus one more time if there's anyone out there anyone else out there my prayer is that you would just have that grace to come forward so we'll sing it one more time oh, what a just thank you so much for just your love and your grace and your mercy in our life. I pray you bless these beautiful people, Lord, and you just keep them uh, close to you, Lord. Keep them coming to church service, Lord. Give them power, Father God. Give them grace. Encourage them in every way. Thank you, Lord, so much for who you are, for what you've done, and just the new work that I believe you're doing in all of our lives. We love you. We thank you. We pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I would have you guys do one more song, but we're running out of time. So.
That's, I think that's it. God bless you, because we have to start a service in 15 minutes.